Hello, disciples. Gods in D&D &D are very much a thing, and there sure are many of them. From the god of baby showers, to the god of gaslighting, to very much not Big J, we swear, D&D gods are a dime a dozen and they take up a ton of D&D lore. But are they actually good for the game? And more importantly, is store-bought fine, or should you make your own? I'm Antonio D'Amico, this is Pointy Hat, and we're gonna answer that question and many, many more in today's episode of D&D &D with a Twist, God Edition. So when I think of gods, I think of... I knew you would come, but you've come. I have come. Gods are the concept, I guess, for people with delusions of grandeur and card-holding members of the Catholic Guild Association. So talking about D&D gods is hard because there's 3,000 of these, and let's make one thing clear, I'm not gonna talk about all of them. This video cannot be 70 hours long. I checked, actually, and YouTube would most likely snipe me out of existence as a warning and make it look like it was an accident. So let's cover the basics. In the beauty pageant that is D&D heaven, gods are divided along the ranking of powers. Think of this as a tier list because that is exactly what it is. There are lesser deities, the lower of the actual, honest to god, <laughs> deities. Uh, um, how do I make this information digestible to brain rotted viewers? Lesser deities have no gyat, elriz, and get mogged by sigma intermediate and greater gods. Skibbity. If that was somehow not clear to you, lesser deities are at the bottom of the ranking of powers. But you know, they're still gods, so they can still snap someone's neck if they look at them for too long. D&D gods work by Tinkerbell rules, which means they are more powerful the more people worship them, and lesser deities have followers in the thousands, but no more than that. They tend to serve other, cooler gods, like the divine beta orbiters of heaven to the holier stasis and chads of the divine realms. A lesser god, for example, is Melil, which is condemned to lesser godhood forever due to his silly little aim. He is the god of poetry and song reigning over the SoundCloud Divine Realm and looking over listen to my mixtape rappers and impossibly talented musicians that were gone too soon. Intermediate gods, which is somehow a less cool name than lesser, are mid. Mid gods are of mid power and mid follower count in the Divine Cloud game. They have more power and more worshippers than lesser gods and less than greater gods. Duh. A lot of these guys end up being quite popular because they have enough power to feel cool, but not too much power so that they feel way too removed from anything that actually matters to the game. In intermediate tier, you get gods like Underwater Girl Boss Evil Mermaid Queen Umberly, or, you know, D&D Jesus. That's right, in this game he only gets up to intermediate, somehow. Moving on to the top of the food chain. I don't like that that implies they eat each other. We have greater deities. These are the big boys, the impossibly powerful guys whose scale is literally impossible to comprehend for puny mortal minds. They have millions of followers and are literally above everything. They are the stars of the show. This is a place for legends. Asmodeus, Chantia, Lathander, Loth, Evil God Saber. Even if you're only barely familiar with D&D gods, you have probably heard of some of these. They are the big boys. So that was a lot, huh? Glad we're done. We can now move on to no. Of course not. We needed more gods, you see. The more gods, the better the game. It's better when there's a lot of them. There are not only lesser, intermediate, and greater gods, but also demigods. Your Herculeses of the world. Honey, you mean Hercules! These are... Um, well, you see, when a god and their cleric love each other very much... Demigods are quasi-deities, which is yet another sub-subcategory. I am God's toughest soldier for making this simple and easy to understand, believe me. They are less powerful than even lesser gods, and they are sometimes, maybe, depending on the day, kinda not really immortal. Not only are demigods a thing in D&D, but there are also dead powers. Dead powers are, you guessed it, the edgy option. But also, you guessed it again, dead gods. Gods cannot truly be killed, or can they? But they can be inconvenienced for a long time, which is what a dead power is. Death to a god basically comes when another god pays them a visit in their home plane and brings them a foot basket and, you know, death. Only a god can kill a god. Or can they? But it can also happen if they get cancelled and lose all their followers. RIP in pieces. When death, like actual death, happens to a god, the bodies of gods will drift into the astral plane and become islands upon which beautiful land development projects can take place and the Githyanki can build strip malls and bowling alleys upon their carcasses. Neat! Honestly, whether a god can even die is kind of contradicted several times in the text, in that we have literal cadavers of gods in the astral plane, but also, it is also plainly stated that gods cannot die, and several gods have died and then 
gotten better. So yeah, theoretically possible, but also actually possible, but also not possible at all. This game is 50 years old, people. Canon was bound to contradict itself at some point. Okay, so that's our rundown on how D&D gods worked, and that's all well and good. But before we talk about gods and their problems, we gotta meet our cast so we can have some concrete examples. So let's talk a bit about some specific gods. But what are gods most known for? Creation, of course, and their domains. Some gods reign over underwater cities in the plain of water, some reign over deserts of crystal where the sand is made of glass, and some reign over nothing, a swirling void where the only place to stand on your own feet are the carcasses of other dead gods. If you seek the favor of gods, or you seek to fight them, you'll end up in their domains. And luckily, Chepeku is here to give them to you. That's right, Chepeku is back, and so are their maps. I use them in my actual game, so they come personally recommended by me. Why? Because there are more than 4,000 of these bad boys. More than 4K hand-drawn, beautiful fantasy maps and D&D battle maps to really bring your players wherever you could ever want to bring them. And getting these maps could not be easier. Just head over to their Patreon in the description of this very video you're watching, choose the Master Cartographer membership level, and you can get your grubby little hands on their entire stock of maps. Maps come with variations like different seasons for all your fall aesthetic needs, but also weather effects like rain and snow, and much, much more, including time of day, which is fantastic because I'm such a stickler for the map actually reflecting stuff like that. So if bringing a new level of immersion and just outright beauty and stunning craftsmanship and polish to your table sounds like a good idea, which, come on now, check out their Patreon in the description of this very video. And thank you, Chepeku, for sponsoring the hat. So once again, we're not going through every god because I love myself and I don't want to be trapped in this plane, I mean video, for a thousand years. So I'll just do some heavy hitters. Pipe up in the comments if your chosen divine daddy made the list. First up, patron deity of goth girlfriends of all planes of existence, a Lady Shah. Lady Shah. Shah, literally called Dark Lady, Lady Shah, or Mistress of the Night, Elvira is quaking, is the goddess of darkness and night in Faerun. Yes, another one. They're honest to God, <laughs> like seven of these, and they are basically indistinguishable from one another, which I guess is what happens when you put so many gods in your setting. Ebony Darkness Dementia Raven, wait, no, no, that one. Yep, that's the one. Embodies all evil aspects of night and darkness. Whereas Salune, her sister, yet another night-themed goddess, embodies all good things that come with night, like Halloween parties and anime endings with fireworks in them. Whereas the Lady Shah embodies secrets, concealment, and more importantly, loss. She's darkness not in a let's catch some Z's way, but in a hide in the dark quietly and wait to strike those you want dead kind of way. The lost thing is big, really big if you played Baldur's Gate 3. Char is lost in the absence of light, but also in the literal absence of everything, including memories. Char can make you forget anything, which might seem like a nice thing, but she's literally against healing. If you seek out Char to forget what breaks your achy breaky heart, you will never truly heal that wound. You will just forget it's there, become numb to it. In other news, play Baldur's Gate 3. If you haven't gathered by now, she's what in this industry we call bad, which is yet another aspect of D&D gods that is very much present. D&D gods can straight up be meanies openly and unashamedly, which is more of a thing in polytheistic religions, which D&D very much is. A lot. But you know, not that much of a thing. Not many cultures have an evil god. And it also doesn't even make that much sense in D&D because how many sickos are you really gonna find that openly worship an objectively evil god? Because apparently it's millions because there are many, many evil greater deities. Weird to me. But anyway, next up, the god of tech bros, IT techs, and the sad little people that insist that they are artists when a machine vomits up a mess of stolen art after they typed anime girl big bahongalongas into it. Primus, the god of Mechanus. Kind of a deep cut, I know, but I wanted to include this genderless guy to show just how many gods there are in D&D. So many. Anyway, Primus is literally not the god of anything but Mechanus, the clockwork outer plane of neutrality and order. That's right, their portfolio is just Mechanus, the place. Primus has a lot of supercomputer god vibes, which I wish it went more in that direction, because that's so sick to me. They sit at the top of the Modron hierarchy. Modrons, I honestly don't know if it's Modrons or Modrons, so I'm just gonna guess, and you can scream at me if I get it wrong. <laughs> I'm trying my best. Modrons are being that live and are created in Mechanus, and they would be really, really cool if they didn't look like this. 
Ew. Mechanus runs like a machine, and so do its residents. There's a finite, perfectly controlled number of Modrons, and there shall never be one more or one less. If a Modron dies, another one will rise to take its place. Modrons are divided in super rigid tier lists. These minion-looking nightmares are at the very bottom, and we go through several new fun abominations as we go up, with duodrons, tridrones, quadrones, pentadrones, pauldrons, squadrons, and cauldrons, to name just a few. And at the very top sits their god. God, the supreme Modron, Primus. What's fun about Primus is that they can die. That sounded weird. But Primus can very much die, and it's fun. When a Modron dies, the one directly below the dead one takes its spot in the hierarchy, and a new Monodrone is created. If Primus dies, which they have several times, the highest ranking Modron will just take the place of Primus. So Primus isn't immortal, but in practice, yes they are. This keeps the minion army healthy so that they can fight demons. Yep, they do that. Look how long this video is already. We don't have time to get into that. Maybe one day we'll do Mechanus. Not now. We're gonna talk about one last god, and we've given the goat gods a ton of shine. So let's do a smaller one. Umberly, literally called the bitch queen. <laughs> <laughs> because she's the coolest god, is one of the 1700 gods of the sea, and one of my favorite gods in all of D&D canon. Because she's just fun to put in games. Umberly is bad in an uncomplicated, Disney villain-esque way. She is worshipped quite a lot, not because she's well-liked, but because people are scared of her, but they still need to sail, and she will sink their ships if they don't pray to her. So sailors are forced to embrace simphood out of fear, which is fun. She's fun. I, I love her. Her domain is the sea, and more specifically, anything bad that happens in it. Storms? That's Umberly. Tsunamis? That's also Umberly. A weird f***ed up fish that looks like it hurts to be him? That's most definitely also Umberly's doing. Another fantastic thing about Umberly is that she's not pretty, which is a novelty among D&D goddesses and the Coomer design convention behind their design. But it also feels like she loves being just the grossest. She's said to appear to sailors in the middle of a storm as this like several stories tall woman who smells like the world worst fish market and looks worse or sometimes when she's feeling flirty i guess just a guy with the head of a manatee and a seaweed wig umberly best god academy award oh and also she could just straight up turn into a kraken fun personality wise she's insufferable a hundred percent certified Bad guy. Duh. She takes immense pleasure in being a pain in the ass of everyone that sails the sea, lives next to the sea, looks at the sea weird, is vaguely aware of the concept of the sea, and she'll make you pay for that. She also loves gold and jewels and treasure and wants it all the time, forever. Which in my world means that Umberly temples are surprisingly very rich due to all the constant flux of tribute sailors need to pay this ass pimple of a god to let them work in peace. This is surprising because in my world, you wouldn't expect an Umberly temple to have anything valuable in it, since in my games, they look like these gross waterlogged monstrosities made out of shipwrecked carcasses of ships and the bone and lard of beach whales, and of this beautiful neo classical thing they went for in Baldur's Gate 3. I'm still upset at this. Let Umberly be gross, please. The outfit you get there does laugh, though. Good job on that. Okay, so we've explained how the god tier list works in D&D. We've talked about a whole bunch of gods, but what if we gave gods a new twist? So you want to make a god. Jesus, it was seen. Where, Rachel? Oh my god. Show me to me, please. <laughs> Send it to me, Rachel. <laughs> so I'm just gonna take a wild guess as to how gods have been used in like 99% campaigns out there. Most commonly, they just weren't. That's it. Gods were basically non-existent in your campaign other than like the one time y'all went to a temple. Second most common is one god was. The god that the cleric, or sometimes the paladin, worshipped. And that one got an impossibly large amount of screen time compared to literally any other god. To the point where it felt like it was the only god in the setting, and definitely the only one that even cared about whatever world-threatening event the party planned to stop. Somehow. The last one is that three, or at most five of them were involved, and this is only reserved in a campaign that is literally about gods. Either each member of the party is somehow connected to one, or the main conflict of the campaign is about gods not getting along, which is... 99% of what gods, not just in D&D, but in any polytheistic system do, the other gods that were presumably also there were just never seen. They, they didn't have that much to say, I guess. Maybe they were shy. Did I get it right though? Was any of those one you experienced? You owe me, I don't know, a cookie if I did. Okay, I'll get to it. Here's the thing I'm getting at. Gods, as they stand in D&D, are like a constant and ever-present source of plot contrivance. 
First up, what is a plot contrivance? I'm not a massive fan of the world plot hole. It's one of those words that used to mean something and now it doesn't because it has permeated the wider word sphere and everything that isn't explained to the audience like they are five is a plot hole, which I love this. I love this so much. I love it when in movies people explain everything to me because people can't just assume things now. It's, it's so fun. Anyway, a plot contrivance is just a thing that feels a touch too convenient. Yes, if our heroes need to do a daring escape, it is possible that someone left their car unlocked and the keys in the ignition so they can get away safely. That's a possible thing that could happen. But just because it's possible, it doesn't mean it's not contrived. Even things that are explained in the narrative can feel like a plot contrivance. If I tell you that in this horror movie that takes place on a dark, dark road or something, no one has signal, it doesn't matter how many times the characters go, oh my god, my my phone has no signal. It still feels mighty convenient that it just so happened to be that way. That's a plot contrivance. So why do I say that gods in D&D as they are set up right now are just a constant source of them? Because, and you might have picked up on this if you're a true detective with my extremely subtle hints at it, there are just too many of them. D&D has a god infestation, and it only keeps getting more and more bloated. Practically everything has its own dedicated god, to the point where gods share domains and they rule over the same thing, making it doubly confusing and doubly silly. Like, do we need these many sea gods and sun gods and moon goddesses? Do we? And I'm not even talking about the DLC collab ones like Anubis or Loki. I'm not even gonna touch those. But why is that a problem? Well, it's complicated and complex, like a salad or my talent. Using even one god of the D&D pantheon directly implies that all others are also there. They also exist, you know, floating in the ether doing whatever gods do, which creates this weird thing where you gotta ask, why is only one god or like two or three helping? Where the hell have you been all this time? There are a lot of other planets in the universe. Either by empowering a cleric or by getting down and dirty themselves by manifesting a small part of their power in the material plane. If the evil wizard apostrophe hyphen name is threatening to destroy the entire world as we know it, why is only the cleric's god helping. It seems like this god is down to give this random guy magic powers and premium best in slot swords and perform actual honest to god <laughs> divine intervention. Why are the others not helping? Is this god the only one that cares about the world? Why? Why are not the other ones doing anything since there's 7800 of these guys floating around snacking on prayers? And here's the thing, you can answer these questions, sure, but it often leads to you coming up with plot contrivance after plot contrivance to keep the gods in the god pen in order for you to tell your story. Or more commonly, you just don't address it and hope the players don't notice. And then inevitably, someone will and we have a why don't the gods send us some eagles to go to Mordor situation on our hands. But it doesn't end there. Having these many gods makes it extremely hard to implement them in your campaign because you either implement them and make your entire campaign revolve around gods or you ignore 99% of them and focus on the ones you want to involve. Which, once again, asks the question, why are the other gods too busy in the great casino up in the sky to do anything about this while while this one god the DM likes is out here busting his rear end to help these four weirdos save the world. It's also extremely hard to actually know gods and understand the lore because there's a thousand of them, which makes the game harder to play for newcomers, which isn't great either, and leads to some players at the table having a lot of knowledge and some having none. So what do? Well, I know this might be a very unexpected solution, please do not gasp too loud as you experience the shock of your life, just put less gods in there. Take them out, keep your faves and throw the other ones away. Or make some of your own. Store bot is fine, sure, but you can't just make gods. You have that power, seize it. I know, revolutionary, surprising, please use the word brave when describing this incredible revelation in the comments. But okay, hear me out because there's more to this. First off, if you don't wanna do this, I know it's hard to believe, but you don't gotta. If you care about canon and you don't mind hand waving why the 78,000 gods are not coming down to play or picking some clerics to do it for them, or if you don't care about making up contrived reasons as to why they're not, that's perfectly fine. But here's the thing, you do not need a video to tell you that. You know who needs a video? The people that want to make their own. Exactly. Funnily enough, gods are pretty easy to just remove from the fabric of D&D and replace with newer, shinier gods. Literally no class needs them, not even the cleric which can apparently worship domains themselves somehow. But guess what? You also don't need my video to commit deicide. Or I guess you do, if you want to commit deicide and put some new gods. So let's see how we go about making new ones to not run into the problems outlined above. We're gonna make our own pantheon. I made two methods because I felt like it.
One, make many and make them less powerful. Yes, that's right. This first one is essentially to make a ton of gods. But Pointy, didn't you just say that one of the problems was that there were too many gods? Let me cook. Okay, so yes, there are too many cooks in the D&D kitchen. But if you want a ton of gods, there is a way to do this. A good way to make your own pantheons and basically anything else is to stop looking only at fictional examples and start looking at how actual religions have their pantheons set up in real life. Animism is the belief that everything has a soul, from plants to rocks to animals to even stuff like the weather. We're having weather. <laughs> a pretty big animist religion that is still in use in use, being practiced, whatever, is Shintoism. Shintoism hails from Japan and is both animistic and polytheistic, which means that they believe in several gods, that's what polytheism means, and animistic, which I already defined above. Pay attention, little boy, this will be on the test. The way this works is very different with how dweebs that went through a mythology phase as teens are familiar with, because those people mostly focus on Greek and Norse pantheons, but will be very familiar to dweebs that went through an anime phase instead. In Shinto, there are an innumerable number of gods, way more than in ancient Greece, and these gods can be gods of like the literal sun, but 99% of them are gods of like a specific tree, a specific mountain, a specific village. These gods are called kami and are worshipped at public spaces or at home, and only have domain over the thing they are a kami of, so over their specific rock, village, tree, mountain, cliff, storm, whatever. Okay, religion class done, tricked you into learning yet again. How do we put this in practice where it truly, really matters? Our little play pretend games. For our purposes, using this method would make gods relatively common in our world, and most of them would be very much not that powerful. A god of a specific tree might literally die if you cut down their tree, or turn into a vengeful god of that dead tree. If you free the mountain that a specific god rules over of a demonic presence, the god in question might help you out. This approach is way less about concepts and way more about specifics. You can even extrapolate this into concepts, don't get me wrong, but here's the key. Keep it small. There is no god of... I don't know, blacksmithing, but maybe there's a particularly powerful deity of swords, and both warriors and blacksmiths pray to that god when they use or make a sword. That should be about the maximum when it comes to how vague and powerful your gods should be when you use this method. Also, in this method, there are no gods of races like in D&D, but gods of specific tribes, gods of a city, gods of a village. They watch over all members of that city or that tribe or that village, but not every single member of a specific race all over the world. Keep it small. Why is this good? Well, it solves literally all the problems outlined above. This makes it so that gods can come up in your story when you need them, making them so tied to the material realm that it makes even more sense for them to act and interact with the story, but also gives you a believable and non-contrived reason as to why all gods are not helping you defeat the evil wizard apostrophe hyphen name. They are literally the god of some mountain 2,000 miles away. They can't help. <coughs> I'm sick. A fun side effect of making gods less powerful is that it allows you to do the great DM sin of killing a god, JRPG style, without actually committing a sin at all, because killing the god of some stone in the forest is much more believable than your level 20 party killing the god of, I don't know, the concept of magic? But while I feel like this is sick and I would love to play or run a campaign like this, it feels cheap to use this as the way to fix the problems with D&D gods because it feels so different from D&D gods as they are, which is why... This list has a number two. Number two, make few and make them powerful. This is the compromise between something like the Greek pantheon and, you know, um, that one. Make very few gods and make them impossibly powerful. A Song of Ice and Fire, or as people that don't live in pain of waiting for it every single day call it, Game of Thrones, is a great example of this. Most people in Westeros worship one single god, and many people in Essos worship another god. And those are the big players in this world, other than the old gods, but we don't talk about those. In order for this method to work, there cannot be 20 gods. There cannot be 10. I will say, limit yourself to 2, or at most, 3. Gods like the ones made in this method represent extremely large concepts, or many concepts at once, and are oftentimes more powerful powerful than D&D greater deities. There's no one big god of magic. There is one god who has magic as a part of their portfolio, which includes like seven other things. They represent extremely large concepts and many concepts at once, and are so incredibly powerful that they remain distant because they are extremely powerful, or another reason. But it's easy to come up with that reason because there's two guys to keep away from the world, not 700. If you're thinking, that sounds hard, you would be right. So why don't we actually make some gods here in this video you're watching to show you how to go about it. 
For my example, I'm gonna do two gods. And to start, I'm gonna choose something that is more of a symbol rather than a domain. Many civilizations base their gods on celestial bodies. So let's do that right now in our world. Oh God, I need a name for this. Examplia. There are two gods, the sun goddess and the moon god. There, I did it. Just kidding, it's much harder than that. Let's pick some themes. Since we're going with two, let's go with dichotomies, life and death, extroversion and introversion, inner world and outside world, magic and might, war and peace. These are all aspects that we can take and graft onto our baseline sun and moon gods to start building them up. A good way to go from here is to then take a look at cleric domains, which are like an actual mechanic thing that involves D&D gods, and check to see if we have them all covered with our little baby pantheon. We need to cover a ton of stuff, baseline stuff like life and death, but also stuff like forge, nature, order, and graves. Okay, how do we go about this? Do we just randomly cram one of each domain in these two gods? No, because that would lead to them being very thematically inconsistent and therefore boring and bland and bad. We're gonna do aspects. The aspect of a god is basically the idea that one god can manifest itself in different ways to embody a specific part of that god. In Greek mythology, these are symbolized by an epithet, literally just adding a thing at the end of the name to point out that this is a different aspect of the same god, Aphrodite Pandemus, the people's Chad, versus Aphrodite Urania, the holy Volsa. This sounds complicated until you realize it's literally how the religion of the Seven is set up in Game of Thrones. People worship one god who has seven aspects, and each of these aspects rules over a specific domain, but they are all aspects of the same god. That's how we're gonna fix this two-god problem. Okay, let's get to it. Let's use my tried and true method here. The KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. Each of these gods is gonna get three aspects and one main dichotomy to define them because it's easy to remember. The Sun Goddess is the goddess of creation. Through her domain of creation, she rules over the outside world and everything that is brought into it. Her three aspects are Sunrise, Zenith, and Sunset. See? Easy to remember. Easy to understand. Simple. As the god of creation, she is the god of action, of manifesting, of doing, of making. The sunrise aspect rules over the beginning of creation. This aspect rules over children, but also parents, birth, and all nature on solid ground, as it's the source of creation that most living things enjoy. Art is also considered to be ruled under this domain, like song, dance, and painting are seen as being created from nothing. She's associated with inspiration, which is seen as divine in origin. It's also the aspect most commonly associated with light worship, as sunrise is when light is brought back into the world. Worshippers of sunrise are usually farmers, but also druids, teachers, expectant mothers, parents, and many artists. Looking back to our domain checklist real quick, with one aspect we've already covered, life, light, and nature. Solid. Isn't it weird that there's no art domain? It's just strange. Anyway, on to the next aspect. The zenith aspect is the aspect of the sun goddess that rules over maintaining creation. It's the hard work that comes after something is brought into this world. It's the magic of routine. It's the aspect that rules over medicine, prolonging life, and ensuring that it continues. But it's also the aspect that rules over cities, politics, and everyday life, maintaining the order of things. Worshippers of this aspect are extremely varied, ranging from nurses and doctors to politicians and ambassadors. Checking back on our domain list, we have added order and peace to our list of domains that are covered and literally double down on light and life. And arguably grave, although don't worry, that is coming hot right now. Finally, since the sun goddess is the goddess of creation, she also rules over the end of creation through the sunset aspect. She's the aspect that ensures that all that is created comes to an end, including life, but not exclusively. She's also the end of war and the end of peace. She's the disruption of a through line, the one that ensures that what begins ends so new things can begin in turn. Worshippers of the sunset aspect are end of life caregivers and morticians, but also just as many politicians. Soldiers and generals pray to this aspect, but also peaceful protesters and the downtrodden who are wishing for an end to their suffering. She's the aspect with the most varied worshippers. Looking at our domain list again, the sunset aspect covers grave, peace, and war. Just so you're aware, the only domains we have not covered yet are Death, Arcana, Forge, Knowledge, Tempest, Trickery, and Twilight. That's 7 out of 14. Wow, when you look at that, it's exactly half the list. It's as if someone put a lot of thought into this. I wonder who. Anyway, the aspect of Sunset is the aspect that is the most different out of the three, because she's the aspect that leads onto the other god. At the end of the day, the sun goddess dies over the horizon line, and the moon god is born out of the opposite side of the world. If we made the sun goddess the goddess of creation, the moon god is the god of mutation. The moon god is the god of change, the god of transformation. 
While the Sun Goddess, through her domain of creation, ruled over the outside world and its creations, the Moon God rules over the inner world of creatures and the changes in their lives. It's a god that rules over the inner lives of people and ferries all to change and grow. And, as always, we're 10 toes into the kiss method, baby, so he gets three aspects too. The waxing aspect rules over the beginning of change. He's the psychopomp aspect. This aspect ferries and helps dead souls that just saw their lives end with the sunset to transition from the world of the living to the world of the dead. The waxing aspect also rules over the passage from day to night. He's the transition period before new moments, the divine inspiration that kickstarts change. Worshippers of this aspect include many priests, as they conduct the end-of-life rites, but also entrepreneurs, and those starting big journeys that will bring great change to their lives, including many adventurers. On our checklist, we can cross Twilight off, but also Order and Grave for a different flavor of those. Neat! The Full Moon aspect is the heart of change. He is the time when something, anything, is in the middle of transformation. He rules over change that is ever ongoing, in anyone's life which is why he's most associated with academics and arcanists, since they are the ones that spend their lives constantly changing as they seek and gain more and more knowledge. And since magic is, at its core, about changing and influencing the world around you through your inner will, he also rules over magic. He's the god of crafters, as they dedicate their lives to change creation into whatever they desire to create. Finally, he's the one that presides over the aspects of nature that is in constant flux and change, such as the weather and the sea. As such, most worshippers of these aspects are scholars, wizards, but also blacksmiths, artificers, and of course, sailors. That is arcana, knowledge, and tempest domains in the bag, baby, and we just have one last aspect to take care of. The final aspect of the god of the moon is the waning aspect. He rules over the end of change, as in order for change to exist, it must at some point end. If the waxing aspect is the psychopomp, the one that ferries the souls into the afterlife, the waning aspect is the one that rules over this afterlife, the end of change. He's also associated with darkness, the end of light, and anything that must take place in the dark. Most often this is associated with crimes and deceit, but he also rules over sleep, nightmares, and dreams, and you know, what happens when you turn the lights off? Birds and the Bees, God Edition, you get it. As such, worshippers of the waning aspect are extremely varied. Some are necromancers, spies, and criminals, but also innkeepers and pleasure house owners. And just so you can double check my own work, that's trickery and death as new domains. Which means, we did it, Joe. We checked all our boxes. Now, the last and final ingredient is the most fun one, and it's flavor. Who are these gods? Are they lovers? Are they siblings? Are they enemies? What if they are lovers who constantly chase after one another in the sky? What if they are the same god and it dies at the end of each day and is reborn at the beginning of each night only to die again as night turns into day? Flavor is important because we gotta answer one last question. What is stopping these two weirdos from fixing everything or, conversely, messing everything up? Yes, this is the source of contrivance we talked about, but you'll find that it's much easier and much less contrived to come up with something when you have to account for two gods and not, I don't know, 739? Maybe there's a third god, the god of the horizon, the god of the sky, and it literally stops the two gods from meddling into the material plane, confining them to the sky, and only letting them nudge the events of the material plane by choosing champions and exarchs. Kinda like Ao does in D&D cosmology, but only kinda. Maybe these two are lovebirds who are constantly chasing after one another, and the material plane means nothing to them. Their divine energy is what powers up divine magic in this world, literally just by having them exist. And they could actually care less about what mortals do and don't. If you want to go for that puny mortal literally too small for God to notice vibe, this is the one. So we've severely limited the number of gods in our setting, yes, but we've made them complex gods that feel much more tied to the setting itself, that we have a good reason both for existing and for not being constantly ever-present and meddling in everyone's problems without resorting to, like, extreme competitive contrived reaching. And you can pick these two and plop them into your world and give them a twist to make them fit your setting, or, as you know, store-bought is fine, but you can make your own using this method. But what do you do with a god? You make a cleric, of course. What if there was a cleric that fits into this perfectly? Well, it just so happens that my video on clerics has a free subclass in it, and it's the creation subclass, perfect for the sun goddess if you decide to use her. And if you're a big fan of paladins as holy warriors, my paladin video has a free subclass, and it's the oath of love, perfect for the waning moon aspects. Okay, video done, all rise, Mwah.